Palm Sunday, okay? And so the kids have some special stuff they're doing downstairs with reference to that. They're doing some crafts, and, and we're just so blessed to have them there and the wonderful team that's helping them. But we're going to go to the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 19. And if you read along with me, we're going to start down a little ways around verse 28 to bring context in. This is the end of Jesus' time on earth, just the last week, just approaching that time frame. And he knew it. He knew that something was happening. He knew his time had come. But he still taught. He still taught people. And in the previous verses in the book of Luke, he was teaching them about the talents. Some were given five talents, and what did they do with them? They used them. Some were given two, and they used them. And some were given, one was given one, and he sat on it. He was afraid he'd lose it. And so Jesus kind of rebuked that one and blessed the other ones. And then he goes right into the next conversation. It says, after telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of the disciples. And as he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. He said, go into the village over there. As you enter it, you'll see a a young donkey with a foal and that no one has ever ridden, uh, untie it and bring it to me. If anyone asks you why you're, you're untying their colt, <laughs> say the Lord needs it. Now, would you, can you bring that into today? Go over here and take that guy's motorcycle and bring it back over here. And if he asks you why you're doing it, tell him the Lord needs it. <laughs> okay? Got to get, get your head into this now. Okay? <laughs> and so that, but that was the reality. And so guess what? And sure enough, verse 33, as they were untying it, the owner asked them, why are you untying that colt? The disciples said, the Lord needs it. So that was all they needed to hear. So they spread out. They, they came and he, he brought the, uh, the, the young colt to Jesus and they threw their garments over it as a saddle, threw it over the, the colt of a uh, donkey. And when he reached the place, they got on it. And as he rode, the the crowds spread their garments on the road ahead of them. They knew Jesus was special. They knew he had a calling on his life, that he was actually Messiah coming. So they knew things were happening that were very special. It It was approaching the feast week as well. And when they reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, just over the crest, All the followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they'd seen in Jesus' life. Blessing on the, and this is what they said, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees said, stop, teacher, rebuke your your followers. And he said, if I tell them to keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Was it an exciting time? Was there great joy there? There was, wasn't there? You can imagine the pictures of them waving the palm branches and singing and glorifying Jesus. And so I I wanted you to see what it looked like. And so they've got a slide they'll put up. See, this is uh, Jerusalem. You see all the homes and that on the the left side of of the screen. You can see where the Temple Mount is, and actually the Temple Mount is still there, and you can see the old city just like that. I encourage you to come to Israel with us, uh, hopefully in November, if we can get it together. We, if they'll let us come, we'd like to go then. But Mount, the, the Mount of Olives now is, is mostly covered with all, all kinds of houses. It's all built up, but not in that day. And then on the, on the side facing the Jerusalem is all a huge cemetery. But Jesus got up and walked up that red line, and as he crossed over, everybody's shouting, praising God for who he is, recognizing for who he is. But look at the next verse and see what his response is. This this is significant. But as they came closer to Jerusalem, and he saw the city ahead, Jesus began to weep. And this is what he said in verse 42. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. Let me say it again. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. 
Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in and, and close in on you from every side. He was talking to the city and he was talking to the people. They'll crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God came to you. Mm-hmm. Jesus, in a time when everybody was rejoicing, was weeping because he cared for the people of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. He saw ahead of time that in just a few years, just maybe 30 years or so, 35 years, the, the city would be broken down, torn apart, the temple would be destroyed. He saw that in his spirit. He knew it was going to happen. And so he wept over the city and he wept over the people that would be caught in the midst of that as well. It was a time of great pressure in his life. But yet when we consider what he really did, Mm -hmm. and we go over into the New Testament further, almost at the end of the book, in the book of Hebrews, it says, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He he endured the shame. Mm -hmm. Joy was inside of Jesus even as he was weeping. He was experiencing the reality of the moment he was in, looking forward to what was happening in the future, knowing it was God's will, but still it was going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. But yet he still carried on, and he still went through it all, and he died and he rose again for all of us. When I think of this, I, I just think of the day we're living in right now. Father, help us to be able to understand how we should live in times of pressure, how we should know the way to peace, the way of living in peace. Help us to understand from your word what you want us to know today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn over in the book of Philippians to chapter 4 with me, please. And I wanna, I'm going to help us understand some of these things on how do we live in a, in a day like this when there's so much pressure around us. Do we just live like everyone else, or do we live differently? God always wants us to live His way, doesn't He? In Philippians chapter 4, the first few verses talk about two sisters in the Lord that were in disagreement. I know you never have that happen. That would never happen in your family, would it? Just look straight ahead. We'll know, we'll know it's you. It's okay. <laughs> But look down in verse number four, because it's, it's our response that's what's important. And, and we we're talking about the way to peace. Uh, it, it really starts with rejoicing in the Lord and rejoicing. L- let me read it. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. What is that word? Rejoice. Rejoice. Well, if you're rejoicing, it must have been you were joying before. So, so there's joy in every one of us someplace. Children find it very easily. Have you ever seen a little child when they first start walking? You'll be a little while for, for that, Todd and Kalisha. And then maybe your little CJ won't. He'll be like our oldest one. He never walked. He always ran. And he never looked where he was running. So he would often go right into the wall. Or the corner of the wall. He, we come to church with he'd have bruises, and everybody thought, what is that father doing to that child? <laughs> but we understood it was just his joy was full where he was not hanging around doing things slow. He was always going full, full blast. And so here, when you consider this, what does God want with us? Well, he's put his joy inside of us. He wants us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Do we need this in a time of pressure? This this is God's antidote for the season we're living in. That we would rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Be considerate to those around you is what the next verse says. Always uh, present yourself in a way that is a blessing to others. Instead of pushing them away, we pull them towards us. So what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? It means that we choose even in a time of pressure or difficulty, to lift up our voice and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness to me. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you, Lord, 
for all the things you've already done. Now, remember he talked about these ladies that didn't, didn't like things? <laughs> Do you know that happens in churches today? Sometimes there's people that, uh, that would like things different. And it's easy to focus on the negative side. And when you do that, you seldom rejoice and you lose your strength. So God wants us to, to, to learn that lesson, my friends, and to be able to, to really stir up joy. I, I put some Bible verses up there. Stir up joys in what you're thinking about it, in the words that you bring out. Use words that bring joy to others. And who can do that for you but yourself? What if your family is not joyful around you? What does that cause you to do? I found, this is what I found over, over the years, that ladies are like the thermostat in the home. They kind of create the environment. Gentlemen, just look straight ahead. Don't talk to your wife. Don't know elbows going at this point. But ladies have that, that, that innate ability to be able to create the environment in the home. I, I think when, when mommy's happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> All right? Just keep looking straight ahead, guys. Okay, okay, we know this. <laughs> and so then, ladies, I want to challenge you to stir up joy when you see things that aren't going your way. Rejoice in the Lord always, anyway, okay? Instead of focusing on the other side of things and wanting to bring correction. Okay, let's just go back there. Just like Saul, Paul, and Silas were in prison in, in the same city, this Philippi, where it was written, and they were in prison at night because they didn't done good things. But people put them in prison anyway. And there was in that prison, instead of focusing on the fact that they're in chains and it's stinky down there and there's a bunch of other people and they're probably going to get beaten again, <laughs> all of this stuff that they could look forward to, what did they do at midnight? Come on, have you read the Bible? They sang and they praised God and they worshiped and they stirred up the joy that was within them that they maybe would not have from the environment around them, but they stirred it up anyway. We are not dependent on what's around us to determine whether we are joyful or not. We have a choice. So they made a choice and they started singing and worshiping at midnight, woke up the others and guess what? God intervened and brought an earthquake and broke off their chains and the prison door opened up. You know the story if you've read the book of Acts in chapter 16. I mean, when we rejoice and praise God and then are considerate of others so they did not run out of the prison and watch the guard get kill himself. They didn't do that. They stopped and they cared for him. And they said, don't, no, don't, don't, don't kill yourself because you've left prisoners go. We're all here and we're all staying. Now that was courageous in itself. And then God used them. And he, yeah. he uh, not only did the earthquake, but he shook up the whole city yeah. and changed, changed things around. I love what it says there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Three verses, but very, very short. Always be joyful, never stop praying, and be thankful in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Can we live this out? Is that possible? In a time of stress, can we live it out? Yeah, so it starts off with rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So rejoicing opens the door to peace. But as we continue on that journey, as the peace comes in, then we need to move to the next step. And as Jesus was taking the road from Bethany to Jerusalem, as he had the triumphal entry, and as, as he was seeing what was ahead, he went and he found a place of prayer. So prayer is the next thing we do. As we rejoice and receive the peace, then we pray. And we ask God, Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything, but with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So as we pray, 
We let our requests be known, but we rejoice and we give thanks. Many times when we pray, we grumble and we complain and we rehearse the situation that we don't like. But God wants us to come to him with hearts of thanksgiving, believing that what we read in his word is true, that he is the God he said he is. He is my healer. He is my provider. He is the one that restores relationships. So as I go to prayer, I'm thankful for what he's doing in my life. I'm thankful that he will open the door of provision for me, even though right now I can't see it. But as I do what's right in his sight, he will do it for me. You know, many years ago, we had a couple businesses, and the church we were in had done a big building project. And uh, at that time, things didn't go well, and the interest rate went to 27%, I think it was. That's not good news. I don't know about you, but if your interest rate on your house was 27%, would you want to rejoice? So, so thing, things weren't in a good situation. We had pressure in our business. It wasn't making it. And people in the church, even some of the leaders, Randy was uh, a photographer and an air traffic controller, and people would come to me and they'd say, what is wrong with your husband? And I think, I didn't think anything was wrong with him. <laughs> they said, why is he so happy? Doesn't he know there's problems here? But you see, he had learned a secret. That if he did what God's word said, God would move on our behalf. And as God would move on our behalf, we would be filled with peace and joy. We couldn't control the situations. But as the peace of God comes over you, as his joy rises up in you, your mind becomes clear. The situation doesn't control your mind, and you can think clearly, and God can speak, so you can obey what he says to bring about the answer needed for the situation. You see, God's word isn't just something we talk about, nice cliches we can say on Sundays, but it is real in everyday life. That if we walk in what he says, it may not look like it's changing. But if we hold on to his word, the change will come. Because he is the God of the impossible. He is the God that turns situations around. He is the God that always honors his word. It will not return void, but it will always accomplish what it goes out to do. So as we pray, we pray about everything, but we give thanks. So you may have a situation that's heavy on you, and you think, how can I give thanks? This is terrible. Well, thank him that you're able to pray. Thank him that you have a God that loves you. Thank him that you're alive and able to receive from him. Don't look at the situation, but thank him for what you do have. Maybe you have food on your table. Maybe you have healthy children in your house. Just thank him for what you do have and trust that he hears you because he always hears his children. Romans 4 says that Abraham called those things that be not as though they were. God said, Abraham, you will be a father of many nations. But Abraham was not a father. He tried to make it work himself and he made a big mess. But when he gave himself to God and believed God's word, God started to move on his behalf. And when Sarah was too old to have children, God made her womb alive. There is nothing God can't do for you if you will believe him. I was telling them in the first service, I like people to call me by my name. The reason being, not, nothing special about my name except my name means youthful. So the more you speak that over me, the more I believe God for youth. The more I believe God for youth, the more I can do for him. Oh, hallelujah. I think some of you need to get a little more excited. 
You know, some days I get up and my body doesn't want to respond. Sometimes my bones are aching. I mean, yesterday we were working at the warehouse and I got out the car when we drove home and I could hardly move to get out the car. My bones aren't as young as they used to be. But I thank God that he gives me strength and that if I keep moving, I can go back and I can help more people another week. You see, we thank him for what we have. And that's exactly what his word is telling us, that as we come to him in prayer, we rejoice and give thanks for what we do have. We believe him for every situation, no matter how dark it looks, if we will believe him, he will open the door and he will start to move. And as we believe him, he will speak to our hearts. So I told you our business was doing terrible. It was not looking good at all. And the only way we could survive was if we could at all borrow some money. But that wasn't a good situation because of the interest rates. And so we were at a full gospel businessmen's meeting. And they were taking up an offering. And I felt such a strong impression of the fire of God in me that we were to give a certain amount. But you see, he was a photographer, so I don't know where he was. He was somewhere taking pictures, and I'm sitting there in the meeting. And normally, I would not give any money without talking to him. But that day, there was such a strong presence of God on me. I knew that I knew that God was speaking. So finally, as it was coming to an end, I thought, I'm just going to do it and just trust God. So I wrote a check. This was in the 70s. I wrote a check for $1,000, like that was big money for us, like huge money. And I knew that it was like the end of our money, but I wrote the check anyway. And I brought, they asked you to bring it up and lay it on the platform. So I came up and I set the check down. And then I was feeling pretty good because I knew God was with me. But then I looked up and on the other side of the platform, I saw my husband laying down a piece of paper. And all of a sudden, fear grabbed my heart. <laughs> I found out after he wrote a $1,000 check. Double blessing. So what I'm telling you is fear started to grab me. I had a choice to make right then and there. I could start worrying I could start saying, God, why did you let this happen? God, why did you do this? How are we going to pay this? But instead, I started to thank God. Father, I thank you you spoke to me. I thank you you know what you're doing in our lives. Father, I thank you you're going to turn this situation around. And I tell you, God is a faithful God. He moved on our behalf. Never once did we borrow for that business. I tell you, God started to turn things. He is such a faithful God. He is so amazing that as we give thanks to him, we pray and give thanks. We don't grumble and complain about the situation, but we give thanks to him that he is a faithful God. He is the God that is our protector. He is the God that is our provider. He's the God that opens a door that no one else can open. He's the God that connects you to somebody, that connects you to somebody, that gets you where you need to be. I tell you, he is amazing. He is wonderful. And he is looking for us to give him thanks and praise. And as we do, we believe his word. But you know what I learned happened in me? As I started to rejoice for situations that looked dark, as I started to believe his word over what I saw, faith started to rise up in me in a level that I didn't have before. Faith started to grab hold that my mind was stayed on peace. That peace kept me. Peace led me and it held me so that I knew that I knew that I knew that my God was more than enough. I may not know what's 
going to change. I may not know how to change it, but I knew that my God was more than enough. I could tell you story after story in our lives where it looked dark, but God came and moved, where God turned what couldn't be turned and opened things that couldn't be opened. I tell you, God is an amazing God. He's moved in me and my health. He's moved in us in our family. He's moved in us in building. He's moved in us in so many ways. He wants to continue to be our God. And he doesn't just want to move in us for me to tell you stories. He wants your faith to be strengthened so that when you are in life and life faces you in the face and you don't know what to do, that you will remember to praise him. You'll remember to grab hold of his word and you will see him move on your behalf because your story is important to him and your story is something that's going to turn the heart of someone else. Oh, we serve an amazing God, his faithfulness to us. And as I said, as Abraham called those things, God did amazing miracle. And you and I are the seed of Abraham because he stood and he thanked God and he continued to walk in what God said. Prayer with thanksgiving guards our heart and minds. That peace takes over and consumes us so that we can walk through the troubles we can walk through whatever situation comes and we are not moved. We, we, we may have a little, but down in our heart, we are stayed on the foundation of God. I remember one last story before Pastor comes back and closes. We were in uh, Gujarat in India and it was just a terrible time. Out of the dark of night, these rebels came, and they're throwing pipe bomb, bombs at us, and uh, equipment's flying up in the air, sound system, guitars are just flying, like it, it was just a horrible night. And I remember seeing a policeman in full battle gear, and he's standing behind the platform. And some righteous indignation rose up inside me. And I went and I grabbed him. I said, get out and do your job. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I found myself standing in front of the platform and the policeman's running back behind the platform. A lot of good he was. Now, all policemen aren't like that one. But what suddenly hit me was, is the gospel worth it? And I remember standing there and I remember the thoughts crossing my mind. Is it worth this? And I want to tell you, I made a decision that night that Jesus is worth everything in my life. Well, I'm telling you this because even in the midst of that situation, a peace came over me. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if I was coming back to Canada. What I knew was that I knew that I knew that I knew that my life was in Jesus' hands and he does all things well and he will do what's best concerning me. So when his peace overtakes you, he will do what's best concerning you. Now, of course, I'm very happy to report I did return to Canada. We, we were safe the rest of the time. I'm very thankful for that. But you see, the important thing is do you know his peace in your life when life's situation comes up? Do you know how to grab on and give him thanks even though it may be looking dark around you? Because it's the secret to us staying strong in him and seeing him move from the impossible in our life to the supernatural possible that he wants to do for you and I. See, God really does know the day we're living in. He knows we're living in a time of pressure. We're living in a time when there's all kinds of things going on around us, around the world. But he's not left us. He's here with us. He's given us his precious word in the Bible to help us be able to focus our attention in the right direction. 
to be able to walk with him each day and be successful. God wants you to have peace on the inside. That's the most important thing. Even when there's not peace on the outside that surrounds you in your circumstances, you can have peace on the inside. And so it starts as we surrender to him. That's the bottom line. That gets us the relationship with the Prince of Peace. Right? That's where it starts. But then even as a, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, we actually have to do things. We, we, we can't just know things. We actually have to be a doer of the Word of God instead of just a hearer. And so then we need to rejoice even when we don't feel like it. We choose to rejoice. And then when we pray, we, we don't pray the problem. We pray the answer that God has already given us. In, in Mark chapter 11, it says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray. So we pray the desires of our heart that are in line with God's heart. And then the last verse, 8 and 9, why don't you look at it with me? Verse 8 and 9 says it this way. Oh, just a second. There we go. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are, are pure, of lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, any praise, think on these things. See, God knows that the mind is the battlefield. And if we can receive and choose to think on God thoughts, think on what God knows is right, we can focus our mind in the right direction. It will help our heart to follow. And then he continues on that it's thinking, but it's also doing. He says, these things that, I, that you both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Mm -hmm. So consistently, what was that word again? Consistent. Consistently means doing it regularly, making it part of your lifestyle. A lifestyle of following the, these patterns, a, a lifestyle of, of thinking on the God things, thinking about whatsoever things are good about your neighbor, about your wife, about your husband, about your kids, about your grandkids, about your situation around you. Finding the right thing, the good thing, the pure thing, the, the just thing to, to think about is going to help you. And then, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? Speaks. Speaks. So as you feed your mind the, the things of God, as you, as you meditate on what God says, as you meditate on the goodness of God that He has for you and He's spoken about you, it settles down into your heart, not just in your head, where like Jill said, when we were there in Gujarat, I was on the stage, okay, just so you know. And so I had a first-hand view of, of the riot that came towards us. And uh, the friend beside me was hit in the chest with a brick that they threw. And all this kind of stuff that was going on as we were there to share the gospel of Jesus. But peace came. Not from the head. It had already got in the heart. And this is the progress that believers make, my friends. Where you, number one, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's a conscious decision that every person must make as an individual in order to have peace with God. That's where it all starts. And then, even after that, as believers, we're still people, aren't we? How many are people? <laughs> we all are people. We, we all have situations around us, and many times they're challenging ones. But guess what? God never leaves you. He's always with you. In fact, the Holy Spirit lives inside of every believer, and he brings God's word, brings the Bible verses back to your mind so you know where your mind should focus and, and what to think about. Maybe you don't have a house that you want to have, but you trust the Lord that every good and perfect gift comes from above, the Father of light in which there's no shadow of turning. He, do, he doesn't change his mind. He's there to help you. Maybe there's conflict in, in, in a family. Well, guess God, he's still a prince of peace. He says uh, nothing shall come between that husband and wife. That, that's God's plan. He, he, sp he speaks life into it. And when we agree with that and we focus our mind on what God says, 
and we pray what God says, and then we thank him for the answer. That's where thanksgiving comes in before we see the answer. Peace rises up inside of us. And soon, my friends, and I know many of you discovered this already, we can actually live in that peace on a regular, regular basis. And when problems come, sometimes we have to remind ourselves, no, 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 I'm not thinking about all that. I'm putting my attention on what God has already spoken and what God has already showed me. And I will declare the goodness of God shall come here in the land of the living, not just when I die and go to heaven, but right here. And I will see it and I will live it. I like what the ninth verse says. It's not just about thinking. It's not good enough just to know what's right. We have to be doers of the word as well. And that's where I believe God wants to help us today, that we are doers of God's word. Did you receive something today? Let's put our hands up in the air, and let's just appreciate God. Go ahead, and let's just pray. Let's just start to thank him for his goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to me. Thank you, Lord, for our friends online. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one that's joined us here in house as well. Thank you, Lord, for your presence that we tangibly experience when we come together. We thank you, Lord, that you are good and your mercy endures forever and ever. Lord, I thank you that you speak to us. You, you, you let us know that you're loving us and you want the very best for us every single day. And I feel you're calling people to make that conscious decision. Some who've never done it before. Others who've got distracted with the pressures of life. And as we lift our hands, come on, just lift your hands. Say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Yeah, yeah just, say, just say it right out loud. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Jesus, change me from the inside out. Help me to be more like you every day. Let your peace grow in me. You're the Prince of Peace. Thank you for leading me every single day. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. I trust that the Word of God impacted your heart just the way it did mine. Remember, if you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that right now. And then tell a friend so they can join us and be online with us each week. If you'd like to help us be able to continue this ministry around the world, you can do so by clicking the link below. And I believe God's going to bless you as you bless many others. Have a great week. God bless you.